Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hi, I'm Billy Keels, the host of the Going Long Podcast. Freedom. Every week I'm going to be here interviewing the absolute best in the business as it relates to real asset investing, as well as real Main Street investors. We're going to be having conversations where you can listen in and that's going to help you to continue on your path to education so that you feel much more comfortable as well as confident in investing long distance. So make sure that you, uh, that you go ahead and subscribe to the channel. Make sure that you're liking it as well because that way you can get every single episode as soon as it comes out. And by the way, don't forget to leave today's episode a five-star review. Let's go ahead and listen to today's conversation. Welcome to the Going Long Podcast. We're back once again to continue to help to educate you so that you can feel much more comfortable and confident as it regards investing beyond your backyard. I'm your host, Billy Keels. And if you've ever wanted to know what it was like to be a busy medical professional who wants to also create a simple and easy way to directly invest in companies, and receive positive returns from your investments. And guess what? You're going to want to stick around for every single word of this conversation because it's going to be awesome. Because today's guest is not only the president of Pinnacle Physician, Physicians Organization, he's also the founder and fund manager at Vernonville Asset Management, uh, which, is a, which is a company that looks to analyze and purchase and manage domestic and internationally uh, assets. He also has his MBA from Rice University. He is also has his medical degree from Baylor College of, of Medicine, and he's the host of the Physicians, Physicians Road podcast. It gives me great pleasure to welcome to today's show, Dr. Eric Tate. Dr. Tate, welcome to the show. Hey, Billy. Great to connect with you uh, uh, on this video platform. Thanks for hey, having me. Hey, Eric. It's a lot of fun. I am really looking forward to today's conversation. This is a long time in the making, and I'm glad we were able to put it in the calendar. Um, Absolutely. So, so listen, before we even get started, there's a couple things that we like to kind of lay the groundwork with. Number one, I want to help us understand what city are you in today? Yes. So I am located in the United States in Houston, Texas. So Houston, Texas is the largest city, largest kind of metropolitan statistical area of the state of Texas. Um, it's about, I don't know, 7 million people in our in our 13 county region. Um, it's right on the Texas Gulf Coast. It's known as the energy capital uh, of the world, meaning we have more concentration of energy companies um, in, in our area than anywhere else um, on the planet. Um, and it's also the most diverse city in the, in the United States. People don't necessarily know that, um, but it is the most d- diverse city in terms of um, international people who live here um, in the United States. Fantastic. In Houston, Texas, wonderful city. I used to live there for many years as well. So thank you for letting us know uh, of that as well, like understanding the, the, the scope of international people uh, in Houston. So um, thank you for that. And then I guess, listen, over the last 24 hours, I'm sure lots and lots of things have happened because you are an extremely productive person. Uh, but can you share with us, what is the most positive thing that's happened to you in the last 24 hours? Um, I had a great bottle of wine last night. Um, and so, you know, Sundays at, at home, we try to keep it fairly low key. So I don't do a lot of work or anything. Um, but I would say, you know, had a nice bottle of red wine with dinner. And, and that was a good highlight of the last 24 hours. Okay. We like that. I have to tell you about my time living in Paris and the things that I was learning about wine as well. So we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that at a different time. <laughs> oh, well, listen, we're, we're actually about to put a, 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 a LOI in on a vineyard here in Texas in the next couple of weeks. So um, oh. we, we've been, we've been hunting vineyards and integrated wine businesses for the past two years. So I know a little bit about, about the industry. Okay. Fantastic. Well, we'll talk about that. And look, speaking of which, so you've helped us understand the most positive thing that's happened to you in the last 24 hours as well. Uh, you've done so many things and I've talked about uh, your, your MD, your, your MBA, and also founding um, Vernonville uh, Asset ma- Management. And I did, those are just some of the highlights. There's so much more to your story and I would love for you to, to share a bit more of your story, some of the different things that you've done to get to this point in your, in your journey, please. Yeah, absolutely. Not a problem. Um, so originally from New York, so the largest, uh, just outside of New York City, so the largest city in the United States, um, migrated, went to Atlanta, Georgia, um, which is the biggest city in the southeast the United States for college. I went to Morales College and then came to Houston to go to graduate school. So you talked about Baylor College of Medicine and Rice University, uh, did a dual degree program. And then I, I practiced medicine um, essentially full time, uh, at least four days a week for the first 10 years of uh, my career. And 
the same time, when I was in business school, I decided I didn't want to be in the stock market personally in terms of investments. So I don't invest in public companies, uh, publicly traded uh, securities. I do not personally um, own them. Um, and that's just because I know kind of, as they say, when you know how the sausage is made, you oftentimes won't eat it. And so once I understood that the value of the underlying asset had nothing to do with the price when it comes to publicly traded companies, I didn't want my money at risk in that kind of way. So I went on, on a mission to try to find other assets that I could own directly and not necessarily control because in the end, I don't care so much about control, but understanding that the, that the price and value were much more aligned, um, irrespective of what other people's emotions were. Um, and so that took me on the path of uh, investing in real estate. So smaller real estate to start with, single family homes, small apartments, um, then led some of my physician friends to want to invest with us. So then we went to securities attorneys. They said, no problem. We put together an investment prospectus, tell them you're going to lose all their money. They still want to invest with you. Go right ahead. And so then we did that. And so we talk about the natural progression of real estate investing, and it goes from kind of small assets to large assets. So single family to multifamily apartments to then commercial, which is where kind of all the institutional players play. And that's been our arc as well. We've just gone from small to large because now we're putting people together in groups to go buy the larger assets. And the interesting thing is the larger the assets you buy, usually the less risk there is because of the more people who have eyes on the project uh, from that standpoint. And so um, after 10 years, I was able to replace my physician income. And so I went down to one day a week practicing clinical medicine in terms of going into the office. And the rest of the time spent with the podcast, uh, mentoring, um, starting businesses, and running the investment uh, side of our business. Wow. Fantastic. So there are, by being able to get to that point where you're running the asset and the, and the investment side of your business, you talked about the, the big cities in the very beginning, right? So, so, so going from, uh, from New York and to Atlanta and to, um, and to Houston. So, so there is a, was that by, by design or was that more by the, the big cities? Uh, by, by design, right? Um, ultimately for me, it was important to have um, one, well, one, for me, college, my uncle had gone to, to Morehouse. Um, okay. It's pretty much the only school that I finished the application um, f- from. Um, and so it just happened to be in Atlanta from that standpoint. And then for for graduate school, yes, um, I needed to be in a diverse city coming out of New York. I needed to have diversity around me. And so if I was going to stay in the South and there were some reasons why I wanted to go to Baylor and Rice because they were just setting up their program, I knew I would have to take the GMAT. So there were some reasons as to why it happened to be in the fourth largest city in the country. I said, okay, this, this will work for me. Um, but yes, I purposely stayed, stayed in, in and around large cities um, culturally and purposefully. Yeah, so in, in being able to do that and understand that, you know, culturally, purposefully, and has, as part of a plan that, you know, that goes back into your your own personal life philosophy, right? And then I'm sure that that impacts also too in your your investment philosophy. But a couple of things that you just said initially, you were talking about the your lack of desire to want to invest in publicly traded companies. And I just want to remark something. You talked about the different price to value, and you also talked about feelings and having having control or, or you're not, not something that you are interested in. Now, I have a couple of different questions, but the one specifically here, what, what when you talk about not that not being the right thing for you, could you help us understand kind of what like what's the what's the undertone for that? What's the, some of the reasons for that? Well, it's actually pretty easy, right? And so I was I was going to business school in 2000. And so if any of you all had been in the market long enough to understand what the high flying company that happened to be out of Houston that happened to recruit heavily from my business school at that time uh, was Enron. And so I literally watched. We, so just so you understand, I was a biology major in college. Business school was the first time I had actually really played with numbers um, in, in, a, in a formal accounting way with formal corporate finance. And so my first accounting class, we actually did Enron's books for 97, 98, and 99. And every year you could see that they had never made any profit from their corporations. It was always one time this, one time that, off balance sheet, this, that, or the other. And I'll never forget the professor circled the negative numbers in three different years and said, the IRS could consider these guys a hobby. And at the time, the stock was still going up. So to me, there was a massive disconnect, right? It's like, okay, well, we know this company isn't making any real money, right? They, They haven't figured out a way from core operations to make any real money. But Wall Street is still rewarding them with ever higher stock prices, right? And to me, in my brain, it just didn't make any sense. And so it was either one of two things. Either they didn't know or they didn't care. 
either way, I couldn't put my money with those people, right? And so for me, the understanding that the emotions of the market will determine my wealth made no sense to me. And I just wasn't willing to, 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 to be a part of that. Well, and that is it's one of the things, and I, I'm glad that you reiterated that point, right? Because it is something that you know I seek all the time because I'm constantly surrounded by very busy professionals that will abdicate a certain portion of that of, of that portion of their life, right? And and when you talk about really understanding the fundament, fundamentals, I think that's something that's extremely important. Um, so this is also too, as you've gone through that, you you mentioned that you started and you were working about four days a week. 10 years later, you'd reduce that by 75% because you were, if I understood correctly, you were down to one day per week also. Mm -hmm. Um, So so talk to us about what that journey looked like for you. And and the reason for that is, I mean, as a, as a medical professional, most people that that's like the ideal place to be. You would want to go from four days to six days a week, right? Because you, you study so much and you, and you do so much to get that type of a role or that into that profession but tell us about what it was like to go from four days down to one day and how you were also building the other side of your life. Yeah, no, I, and honestly, I would say that we even starts before that because mm-hmm. I was purposefully willing to, to work four days, but not five, because I needed that one day to begin to build something for myself. I needed mm-hmm. to build my own equity piece. I needed to, I needed the time and space to build that which no one else was controlling for me. Um, and so in the United States, we have a fragmented healthcare system, which is a little bit different than Europe. Um, we don't have a socialized system where it's kind of one payer, the government's covering everything. And so in the United States, you can have your own private practice, which you can in many European countries as well. Um, or for the most part, you'd be an employee. And the trend in the United States is for physicians to be employees, which means someone else controls your ability to, to make a living. And I was never really comfortable with that. So I always kept that for, that extra day to build something for myself on the side. Uh, my mother would always tell me, you need to own something. She assumed it was going to be a medical practice like her brother and her uncle and her and her grandfather had owned. And I said, no, in today's climate, I need to own something else, something else that is real. A service based business. Great. It's great to own it. But in the end, especially in medicine, there's not a lot of value to it. You can't hand it off to somebody else. You just don't build a lot of equity from that standpoint. And so I needed to build something that was real that I could own. But still, I was understood, understood that I was going to be an employee and was going to make a very good living being that employee, but creating the wealth and income that was outside of my everyday employment. And that was important to me. And so that's why it was four days. And I took less pay to do that, which I was perfectly fine with because I knew I would make it up from an investing standpoint. And so I always have been a planner. That's one thing that I'm decent at is sacrificing today to know what, where I want to ultimately be tomorrow. And so the four days a week was great. You know, I took essentially Wednesdays off. So I got that middle break, which was the hump day break, which was great. And then over time, you know, it, it as you build, and, and I try to explain to our investors that this is a marathon and not a sprint. You're going to build your these income streams over time, uh, unless you're coming with multiple millions of dollars ready to drop them in an, in a in a project tomorrow, which I wouldn't recommend from an asset allocation standpoint. But let's just say you did. You're not going to retire off of one deal or two deals. You're going to build a portfolio just like you would with a 401k or any other kind of defined um, contribution plan, except for that you're funneling the assets to something different that can actually give you a benefit today, right? And so it was just a process over time that over it just snowballs. And then I got to the point where um, it flipped and I said, okay, I can start my own practice, a small practice where I'm in control because I've got the money coming from other places. And I will now practice medicine in a way that is not um, controlled by insurance companies and corporate entities that I can practice the way that I want to and was trained to free of the pressures of the monetary pressures of our healthcare system in the United States. Wow. So, so once again, I, I understand that there is a, a constant design uh, in terms of the way that you w- were looking and the way that you were able to, even from the very beginning, that rather than five days, it was four days and then being able to work and, and have more control, being able to look at those areas where you can control as well as own. And it's also something that you are now helping uh, your investors and others that you are mentoring and coaching and educating uh, on a day-to-day basis. And I know you, you have a, so going to this, you have a model uh, and I know it's, it, you, if you find a need, fill it, right? And so as you are working with uh, educating speaking to investors, talk to us a little bit about how you, uh, rather than 
convincing, you're recognizing needs and, and attracting uh, the right people um, f- to you. Well, that's the, that's the key, right? I tell people all the time, I'm not in the convincing business. I'm in the opportunity business. All I'm looking for is people whose investment philosophy matches up with what we are doing. I tell people all the time, our deals are going to fund. Our products are going to fund. The question is whether or not it fits with what you're trying to do and are you going to take the opportunity, the action to be a part of the opportunity, right? Um, you shouldn't have to be convinced where to put your money. Ultimately, what you're looking to do is find people who have a philosophy and live the life that you yourself would like to live. And then you just partner with them, right? I tell people, the fa- you, you know, people say all the time, oh, we'll learn from other people's mistakes. I say, no, all you're going to learn to do is how not to do something. Go find the people who are doing what it is you want to do because they figured out how to do it. Doesn't mean every time they do it, it's going to be correct, but they're going to be more successful than not. And just partner with them. It's the easiest shortcut in life, right? I pay personally, I pay for mentorship. I pay for training because I just go to the people who, who have done the things that I want to do and just learn from them. I don't need to know a million ways not to do something. Just show me the one way how to do something. And I'm going to go do that. Yeah, so, so being able to figure out who the person is to, to, to follow, who the person is to ask the questions of that has already done what you're trying to do. And then being able to uh, follow in their lead is a great thing. Well, I guess one of the questions is how do you, I mean, I'm a big believer as well. Like I'm, I'm going to pay for mentorship. I'm going to pay for uh, things because I also believe that when, when I have skin in the game, meaning a financial, uh, a financial uh, investment, then I'm going to pay more attention, right? It's going to focus my energy. But, and I know that I have a particular way of, but what have you found are the ways that you can really test that the person that you believe you want to follow or take their lead, that they've really done what they're, what they said that they've done, I guess it's more of a due diligence kind of question. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the fastest and easiest way is just one, have they done it before? Right. And, and I don't always like that because everybody has to start somewhere. Um, but two, who's on their team, right? Even if they haven't done it, if they have built a team, that has done it by proxy, you're going to be okay. Right. And as long as the, as long as the team runs with the deal, you're fine. I always, I always laugh at my investors. I say, listen, my job is to go out and sniff out, understand the macroeconomic understanding of where we want to be positioned and to go sniff out the experts who are going to make us, who are going to get us there. I could knock on wood, get hit by a bus tomorrow. The deal's still going to run. Right. It's not, I'm not, I am not crucial to the running of the deal. What I'm crucial to is bringing the opportunity to people, right? And so the more you can take out the variable of the individual and let the deal stand on its own, right? and that takes a little time and practice and looking and what have you. But in the end, if there are a prof- trained professionals out there who know how to manage these types of projects, you can always find someone to manage the project. The thing you can't always do is buy it at the right price, right? That's the key to this whole thing, right? Is having a team and buying at the right price. You buy it at the right price, you can change the teams out, right? You've got enough runway and room there. But if you buy something at the wrong price, is re- even if you have a great team, it's really hard to make money, right? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. And so it's a lot less due diligence trying to figure out if somebody can do something than it is you trying to go out and figure out how to do it yourself. And people don't realize that, right? Yeah, I love that. That is, um, that's, that, that's like platinum advice, uh, or platinum knowledge sharing better, better stated, uh, for, for everybody. So it's really a lot about making sure that you, uh, are with someone, number one, who's already done what you're looking to do. And, and if that person hasn't done it, that the team that they're associated with has done what you're looking to do. And, and that, that's such an, that's such an important thing, especially when you're ready to be a part of teams that are, playing at a, at a higher level. Right. Um, and so, so that's key. You know, one of the things that speaking of this kind of, and I know you, you study a lot as well. Um, and you, you know, you can, you can figure out one of the things that you enjoy is understanding what are the, what is it that the ultra wealthy do? Right. And we're in a very unique time, uh, right now where there, there things are kind of falling out of the sky on some, on, on one hand and on the other hand, things are kind of going through the roof, but there's this thing about, you know, the, the fact that, ultra wealthy people do things differently uh, than, than other people, especially in negative times. And maybe you could share some of your insights into what you've seen uh, ultra wealthy people do that allows them to continue to move forward. Yeah. So, I mean, the big thing is they, they go against the grain, right? They don't do what everyone else is doing. That's number one, right? Because if you do what everybody else does, you're going to get what everybody else has. There's a reason why there's a 1% and the 99%. The 99% do the same things. 
the 1% do things differently. And so one, they do things differently, they go against the grain, but that really ends up coming back to kind of a personal development, money psychology thing, right? And so they look at money differently. They look at money as a tool. There's not an emotional attachment to whether they win or lose money. Now, nobody wants to lose money, but the understanding is sometimes that's just tuition to learn the game, right? A lot of us, if you know, if we went to, to, to colleges, if we had to pay anything to go to college, we paid to learn, right? Sometimes investments, even that go badly, as long as you learn what went wrong, it's worth it. And then in the United States, you can write that off from a tax standpoint, and you can make it back up on the next deal. So you never, and I, I don't know the taxation structures of other countries, but in the United States, you never really lose on these projects because you can write them off. Again, check with your tax advisor. Mm-hmm. And when you have another gain in the future, it will come back to you. Right. And so as long as you stay in the game and don't leave it, you'll win. And that's what they understand is that ultimately it this is just a game. Right. There are certain principles about um, that they go about following continuously. Right. Investing is, is very much about cycles and what's in favor, what's not in favor, what's happening and what's not happening. Right. Um, a big thing that we like to do is stay fairly low on Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? The lower you are on, the more human beings need to use those specific things that you may be providing for them, right? Um, and that's just kind of a shortcut kind of thing. And so if you look at the way that the wealthy construct their portfolio, it it's diametrically opposed to how most individuals and what I call middle-class earners, even if you're making a couple hundred grand a year, if you're in mostly 401ks and IRAs and you know most of your wealth is in a house, you are a middle-class investor. If you have private equity, if you have real estate, if you have a smaller proportion of public equities, if you've got a a small proportion of bonds, then you're investing like the wealthy. And again, this isn't me. This is, you can literally look at the the surveys and understand that they construct their portfolios differently than the non-wealthy. And that's just a pure choice situation. We can all do it. People just choose not to do it. Yeah, so so much and a lot of choices. You talk about, you know, this is really about the when we look at certain patterns, it's really about being able to understand what's happening in certain cycles, recognizing that the cycles are there. Also, this whole concept that there's a I'm going to paraphrase a lot of what you were saying, which is really about mindset, right? Because when you when you think about being paid to learn, meaning I e I lost money, that's just a different mindset because you know you also have to have the education, you have to understand where you lose it on one side. And as you talked about, you know, and in, in not sharing any tax advice, but really helping people to understand through education, what types of losses are happening, whether they're active or passive and understanding that game, as you just, as you talked about before, it's so crucial. Uh, and so when you're studying others uh, that are ultra wealthy and you're also playing that game, it just allows you to go and, and, and share that knowledge with other people. And, and one of the other things, I, so I, and just kind of maybe pivoting a little bit, because I'm interested in you telling us a, a bit more about also what, uh, what you're doing um, at Vernonville Asset Management, right? Because there's a lot that happens around education, but not based on theory, because you've actually done it. <laughs> and so yeah. talk to us about how you are going out and, and educating the marketplace, uh, attracting those people that are interested in similar things as yourself. And I just mentioned one, right? We just talked about uh, Vernonville Asset Management, but there are also other different ways that you are helping uh, to educate the marketplace. So maybe you could talk to us about some of the different initiatives that you are, that you're taking forward. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, just, I mean, like being on this podcast, right? I'm a, I'm a frequent podcast guest. People ask me to be on, uh, on their podcast and I'm happy to share a, a, about multiple subject matter, right? And so ultimately what I try to do is give away a lot of knowledge um, as much as possible because people gave that same knowledge to me. And so that we have formal structures where we have, you know, full education pages with webinars that we've done that just, just basically break down the basics of real asset investing and real estate investing and how to use tax deferred um, accounts and how to, at least for the U S based people, tax mitigation strategies and, and, and strategies of the wealthy that anyone can use. You just have to know the right people to, to use it with. Um, and then our newsletter that, that if you're on our newsletter list, we send something out probably once a week, just, just, in, just, it's just informational. Right. Um, and then the big thing we do is, is our investment, um, presentations. And I tell people, even if you're not interested in the particular investment or you don't think you are, watch the presentation because I purposefully make it super educational so that you will understand that industry by watching that. Even if you decide not to invest, you're going to learn about an industry. 
And there are certain levers that doesn't matter what the business is. You've got to understand those levers. You've got to understand what, what drives revenue. You've got to understand what drives expenses. You've got to understand those kinds of little things so that you can take a rubric and then say, okay, I can take this rubric and put it on any investment. I don't care if it's a stock bond, mutual fund, private investment, whatever, and, and filter it through so that you are systematically looking at it all the way through. Our big thing is, you know, market team asset, right? The asset is the least important thing. The market is the most important thing because the market is the problem that you're solving. And then you just go find the team who can do that. So in the end, I don't care. It's the reason why we own coffee plantations in Panama and, and Hilton, and Hilton's in Belize and building student housing here in Houston and light industrial all over Houston and retail and in, in central Texas. And like we own a ton of different types of assets because each of those assets solves a problem that that market had a need for. Right. And that's why I say we're, we're asset class agnostic. So being market class agnostic um, or asset class agnostic, excuse me, um, it, I think is one of the things that's amazing, right? When you talk about the the market, then you see the team, and then you're in, the last thing is the asset. And, and it goes back to the heart of what we talk about here all the time at the Going Long podcast, which is really being able to invest beyond your backyard. So you just talked about Belize, you just talked about uh, Houston, and, and you, talked about, uh, you talked about Panama. So um, I love hearing that you are applying this strategy for yourself, for your investors, because at the end of the day, it really is about understanding what you what you said. What is the who is the market? What is the market? Who is the team? And then ultimately, the last point and the last the least important part, uh, quote unquote, is really the asset. Um, and I'm sure that it was by design as well, because we I think we're seeing the pattern here. Dr. Tate, uh, by the way that you are very strategic in the way that you um, look at things. But when you first made that decision to go beyond Houston and go to, you know, outside of the country, kind of what, what was the, the moment that you said, oh, man, wow, you know what, I need to, this, this looks like the right thing for me, potentially for investors. Take, kind of take us through that. So for us, what we wanted to do as setting up as a company as Vernonville Asset Management, we wanted to be the alternative um, investment platform of choice for our investors, for busy professionals. And so we were creating diversification under our umbrella. So you can pick and choose kind of, hey, I'm going to own some retail here. I'm going to own some some international, some agriculture that's international. And so under our umbrella, you could get geographic diversification. You could get asset class diversification. You could even get currency diversification. And so in doing that, we don't, we don't think that someone should be completely tied to one country, to one currency, even if it is the United States, which has deep liquid markets and great um, legal structures. But in the end, it does have, it does, ha it can have its own issues. And there are places that you can invest that have a better taxation regime, a better regulatory regime for the type of asset that you want to own. And so for us, we wanted to do that early in our arc. Um, we, we took some bruises doing it. Uh, well, on one deal and not on the other. Um, we've taken some bruises doing it. But in the end, because we got the market right because we built correctly, meaning we got the price point in at the right point. We will weather those storms. The other thing is we're long-term investors. We're not in it for you know a three-year cycle necessarily. We, we want to own assets that if we have to hold it through two downturns, if we had to hold it for 10 or 15 years, we could do it. Our investors could still make money, could still make cash flow, even if it got interrupted for short periods of time, that you know we're not traders. We're not getting in and out of deals just to be getting in and out of deals. We want to be able to hold something if we need to indefinitely. So that means we, we went in with the correct thought process on the front end. Wow, I love that. So being able to have the right uh, pr the thought process on the front end, being able to see exactly what uh, anticipate things that could go wrong and also being able to make sure that you're there's an investor alignment. And then um, that's me kind of recapping that that part. Um, but, you know, there are so many different things you even talked about the diversification of a regulatory system or for legal um, legal area for currency so many different things which you know is great to be able to also know that that was part of your plan and being able to say okay we're gonna we're gonna go beyond uh, Houston in this particular point. So, oh man, there, there's so many things I, I just want to keep on <laughs> talking to you about because it's like, wow, it's amazing. Um, but you know what? We get to a certain point, um, Eric, and there I want to be able to talk to you about what I call the going long final three or what we call the going long final three. But the thing is, I never asked the going long final three until you tell me that you're ready for me to ask you the going long final three. So my question is, are you ready? I'm ready. All right, cool. So here we go. Uh, so we know you're extremely well-traveled. 
and all around the globe and would love to know, especially with me being here in Barcelona, here in Europe, I'm always interested in what is your favorite European city, either that you visited or is still on your bucket list? Yeah, so I've passed through London. Uh, I had a trip scheduled a couple of years ago that ended up falling through. Um, and so I, I need to do London with with the, with the wife and family. Um, and so that's right now is on the uh, on the bucket list uh, for European cities. Okay, fantastic. If you happen to make it to London and you want to come down here to Barcelona, just let me know. <laughs> I will. We'll I, will. I, said, I, have, I have a second cousin who's in Barcelona, so I have black family in Spain. Okay, there you go. Even better reason. Awesome. Um, so we talked about this a couple of times before in terms of, well, when you're successful and you're an extremely successful individual. And because of that, you've probably made, I'm going to guess just one probably just one mistake. Just one. Yeah. Only one. And so, yeah. (laughs) So, so, so so let's talk about, uh, if you can think about all the different mistakes, like what, what one lesson would you pass forward to somebody so they can at least listen, understand, and and potentially save them from making the same mistake? Yeah. So it was one of the big lessons I learned early is really, and this was around real assets and real estate is really understand what business you're actually in. And what do I mean by that? Things like hotels, personal care homes, assisted living, um, even student housing are really hospitality plays. So they're operating businesses that use real estate. They're not really real estate plays. And what I mean by that is the typical metrics that run a piece of rental real estate is very different when you come to those those asset classes I just talked about. So having an understanding that you will need a marketing team and all these other things that you won't necessarily need for your typical rental real estate, um, understand that you're in a, you're more of an operating business than an actual um, just passive rental real estate business is a big deal. And people get that confused all the time. They don't they don't understand the amount of work, the the the, the size of the team that they're going to need, and all of those things that go into that. And then the the metrics that then run that versus just a regular rental in that particular marketplace. So understanding the actual business that you are in is kind of the big thing that uh, um, I tell people to try to make sure that they that they understand on the front end because I made that mistake not understanding that. I think that is phenomenal phenomenal, phenomenal lesson, a phenomenal lesson to, to pass forward, because it is definitely not the same thing to talk about uh, what is the uh, occupancy rate, which you could think about on all of those, many of those versus what is the rev par, because that's a very different type of business. And, and I've been working in the hospitality business for quite a while um, in my, in my day job. So you, I love, love that uh, advice and in, in passing that lesson forward to others. Um, and then lastly, Eric, what is the, what is, I know, I know you're an avid reader, but what's the book that you are recommending uh, nowadays? Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to give you, well, I always recommend Rich Dad, Poor Dad in the series. So that's always baseline, but okay. I'm sure everybody says that. So we'll take that out. So I'm going to talk about the book that I just read, right? It's called Hustle Harder, Hustle Smarter by mm. Curtis 50 Cent Jackson. So the rapper 50 Cent, the television mogul 50 Cent, um, the entrepreneur 50 Cent. He actually has a, he's, he's got a great book. Um, he's a very well-read, very accomplished person that many people don't realize kind of talk about strategic thinking. He is a strategic thinker. Um, And I actually learned quite a bit from the book in terms of, in terms of his business dealings, because what you see on the outside, what you think is him flying off the handle or him being a provocateur, there is an absolute reason behind everything that he does that you see him do in the media. None of it is by accident. Every one of it, every piece of it has a plan. Once again, by design. So uh, hustle harder, Hustle smarter. Hustle smarter. Mm-hmm. Okay, fantastic. We'll make sure that, that we include that in the show in the uh, in the show notes, and also just want to uh, highlight the fact that you are also a published author, and so we're going to make sure that uh, that we get your your book as well in the show notes. So um, so so we'll be doing that. So um, listen, Dr. Eric Tate. So many things. I mean, from from New York uh, to Atlanta to Houston, looking for the big city, looking for uh, the diversification, looking for also the the ability to focus and and learn. Uh, we've seen that through MBA. We've seen that through uh, your MD. Uh, we've also seen that from the beginning uh, of your career in terms of an asset manager, 
fund manager and, and someone who is also going out to educate people across the globe, doing that beyond your backyard, uh, beyond Houston, in, in multiple countries, in Belize, in, in Panama that we talked about, and really looking at and understanding the patterns uh, of the wealthy, not just because you've read it, but because you're doing it. And you're also helping to influence and create uh, other successful investors uh, and entrepreneurs moving forward. So, I mean, with all this goodness that you've shared with us, like I know that I want to, and we talked about it earlier, making sure that we're staying in touch, making sure that we're learning from you. Uh, I know that everybody that's watching us and is listening to us also is like, how do I get in touch with Dr. Tate? I've got to figure it out, man. So help us out. How can everyone get in touch with you, find out more about what you're doing at Vernonville Asset Management uh, and more about just what you and your team are doing? Yeah, fairly easy. I'm, I'm, I tell people I'm, I, I, I Google decently well. So my name is Eric, E-R-I-C, Tate, T-A-I-T. Um, so it's spelled a little bit differently than you might think. And the easiest way to just to get with me is just, just email me, Eric, E-R-I-C, at Vernonville, which is V as in Victor, E as in Eric, R as in Robert, N as in Nancy, O as in Octagon, N as in Nancy, V as in Victor, I as in Indigo, L as in Larry, L as in Larry, E as in Eric, Dot com. So Eric at Vernonville.com or just go to Vernonville.com um, and you can sign up for our newsletter. That comes to my assistant um, when you do that and she'll reach out to you to kind of get on a phone call or talk or whatever you want to do. It's no pressure. We just offer it to people um, who are interested. Um, and that's probably the easiest way um, for podcasts. As you said, the, the iTunes or Stitcher or the podcast platform of your choice, it's called The Physician's Road. So R-O-A-D, just you can either put my name in iTunes or put that in. And that we really, we talk about investing principles, but we don't talk about invest specific investments. But we also talk about kind of a life balance wheel for a busy professional. It is highlighted physician, but you could stick in lawyer, you could stick in salesperson, you could stick in whatever. There's only one of our podcast silos that's really focused on medicine, and that's the practice portion. But our relationships, our health, um, our wealth, um, and our personal development portion of it is, it can be for anybody. It's agnostic. It doesn't matter if you're a physician or not. So, um, and that's really kind of about how do you put together uh, a meaningful life that is separate and apart from your identity as whatever profession that you are. Fantastic. So the physician's road, you can go there, learn busy professionals, which I think we know a little bit something about that here. Um, you can go to vernonville.com, uh, Eric at vernonville.com. We'll include all that in the show notes. Um, and you know, Eric, I really, uh, I want to thank you for taking the time, um, uh, to share with us, share your passion, share your insight. Um, because this is something that is once again, helping and just demonstrating, showing how you are, are here to help to grow, to educate uh, others and get closer to their dreams. So thank you so much for, for taking the time to join us here today on the going long podcast. Absolutely. Thank you really for putting something like this together and having a platform like this for busy professionals, because we always feel like we're drowning and don't necessarily know how and where to find, um, these kinds of personal development, um, nuggets. And so you're making it very easy for people to be able to to kind of help and see, see themselves in you and then help them get down the pathway that best suits them. Perfect. Thank you very much for those kind words. So uh, I guess now it's really for the uh, for the going long audience. I want to thank you once again for taking the time to uh, to listen to uh, Dr. Tate and I share some insights, share thoughts. Uh, and and you know what? We really would. Uh, I'd like to ask you to go out and at least share this with two or three other people. You know, as our platform continues to grow, we'd like you to be actively participating in, in growing with other like minded individuals uh, so that we can continue to have excellent guests like Dr. Tate join us and share their insights. Um, we'd love to have you leave a written review as well. Let us know. what do you think about the conversation? How is it really helping you? Um, and, and what other kind of things would you like us to talk about? Maybe that way we can get Dr. Tate to come back again in the future. So um, with that, just want to uh, tell you, I'm really looking forward to welcoming you back to the very next episode. Until then, uh, go out and make it a great day. Wow, don't you love hearing from top-notch experts in the field? You know, when I was getting started, I really wish that I would have had access to such experts. And even more, I wish they would have given me like a really simple list of things to follow so that I could have gotten to my goals much faster and been much happier even sooner. So that's why I've created for you the seven things that you should avoid in order to be successful in long distance investing. And you can pick that up really easily by going to billykeels.com forward slash seven things to avoid. And also, if you like today's episode, don't forget to leave a five star review. I'm looking forward to seeing you on our very next episode. So go out and make it a great day.